I think I've been going to this church for, oh, I got saved in 2012, and uh, a friend of mine invited me to come to a church in Walt Hill, Nebraska. And <laughs> my experience of Walt Hill, I played for the Bloomfield Bees, if you know where that is. Uh, I used to play football, and uh, I remember we came to Walt Hill one time and drove the bus in, and there's kids, you know, little toddlers running around with their diapers, and they're flipping us off, and there's guys passed out on the street, and I'm part native, uh, registered member, member of the Ponca tribe in Nebraska, and I was in my mind thinking, man, this is why Native Americans have a bad name, right? And I thought I was, you know, I thought I was better or something than that and whatnot. But uh, so my my thoughts on Walt Hill were very negative. I thought, man, geez, why would I ever want to come to Walt Hill, Nebraska? You know, let alone go to church there. And my buddy's like, dude, man, you gotta you gotta check this place out. This pastor, he's from Northern Ireland, he's got a crazy accent and God's moving, man. Uh, and uh, that's what happened. I came, and uh, I was a young, born-again Christian, um, just just a babe in Christ, and started coming, um, started getting involved, and uh, just around guys like Pastor Paul and Holiday and Nelson, and those guys just put their arms around me and started to build me up and um, never looked back from that point on, essentially, God just continued to elevate me and, and open up doors. And uh, I can tell you, though, uh, I wouldn't be here without this church, without this body, without men like Pastor Paul and uh, him and Jen coming from Northern Ireland, leaving everything to uh, to build this up because of a vision. So, um, so grateful for that. Met my wife through this church, and, and I'll get through some of that um, with my testimony. Um, so, yeah, I started off. I never grew up in a Christian home necessarily. Um, my mom was Native American. My dad was uh, just a regular guy. He's Catholic. They grew up Catholic in the Catholic Church, and um, you know went to CCD and did all that. But we we were not affiliated with any type of church nor religion. God to us was um, essentially somebody that we went to when things went bad. You know, we we go to God when people were dying or whatever, and uh, at prayer or, you know, at a wedding, you might get mentioned. That is my religious experience growing up. Um, I think I was baptized in Episcopalian. Um, and I can remember, it's weird, uh, for some reason, growing up, my mom, uh, I don't know how I got involved in the Episcopalian church, but I was like a little choir boy. I remember throwing on the, the little suits and standing up there, and they just didn't have any kids in the church, so... I had no clue what I was doing, but I was sitting there and ring the bell, and I had no clue what I was doing, right? And uh, so God God to me was just, like I said, he wasn't anything personal. He didn't care uh, necessarily about me, nor did he want to know who I am. He was just somebody that we would go to when, when bad things happened. And um, that was my experience growing up. I grew up uh, in somewhat of a dysfunctional home, I would say. Um, I don't have uh, I don't have a real thought or memory um, of my father probably up till the age of ten years old. I can't remember one thing uh, vividly about my father. Um, he left when I was six years old, uh, as far as I can remember. Um, mom raised us up, single mom. Uh, my mom has had five boys. Um, all five of us have different dads, which is crazy to say, but. That's the reality. Um, I'd say until the age of 13, um, I never knew who uh, my real dad was. When I was 13 years old, um, I had a gentleman come, and he was my uncle at the time, and he explained to me, hey, this guy who you think is your dad is not your dad, and this guy's actually your dad. And I'm like, wow, okay. Started putting two and two together. You know, me and Jesse, you know, we don't look alike. The dude's 6'2", I'm 5'8". I'm like, yeah, you know, I guess that makes sense, you know, but maybe. And uh, so that was tough, right? Um, but that was life growing up that way. Uh, my mom was, a, I mean, a bad, you know, had a bad background with drugs and alcohol. Um, got into methamphetamine. Um, and uh, life was just, that's what it was. Uh, that was normal. Um Mom was not around a lot. It seemed like she was, but she wasn't there. You know what I mean? So 
Uh, I feel like we had everything. We had food. We had clothes. I mean, I was wearing Nike shirts and Adidas and all this stuff, but uh, no real parental guidance, essentially. Um, I can remember uh, just vivid, vivid memories, just certain things I remember. Uh, like as a second grader, um, at a field trip, I remember uh, I was in the school bus looking at all the kids and everything going on, and, and all the kids are unpacking their lunches, essentially. And I didn't have a lunch, right? My, my mom forgot my lunch, didn't know we had a field trip, whatever. And I can remember, like, feeling embarrassed, right? Here's all these kids. They've got beautiful lunches, lunchable, you know, in my mind. Bananas, milk, all this stuff. It's like, mm, that stuff looks good, you know? And, uh, but but who, who made those lunch? I was thinking in my mind, their parents had to make those lunches, where's my lunch, you know? And I felt ashamed, essentially. And But I can remember at a young age saying, if I ever have children, um, I will make sure they never feel that way. So that was ingrained in my mind. So I wanted to work hard. I wanted to be different. Um, but at the same time, we've got a challenging life, right? Uh, people, men, in, in and out of the house all the time. Drugs being abused in and out all the time. Um, and that just continued until I was in fifth grade. In fifth grade, um, my mother, she got sentenced to, I think it was multiple counts, I think three counts of possession of methamphetamine. They each carried like five to ten years in prison, so... She got sent to prison. All of us boys got separated. At the time, there were, uh, there were three of us boys. Uh, it was me, Jesse, and Dion. Uh, my mom was pregnant with her fourth child, Walker, and Easton came like, you know, 10, 15 years later. But essentially, um, we all got separated. My brother went with an aunt. I went here. My other brother went with his dad. I lived with my uncle um, for like a year and a half, and that, that actually helped me, uh, I would say. Having a man in my life for the first time actually did something. Even though my uncle was imperfect, he was, uh, but he was a man. And, I mean, he taught me to play football and sport and uh, athletics and work hard. He had three different jobs. He played semi-pro football. He was balancing relationships, and he took me in. Uh, which was phenomenal, right, to, to think about. But all of that happened. My mom, um, through prison, uh, has an encounter with Jesus. Like I said, we didn't grow up religious, but essentially, you know, in, in prison, there's, there's, there's all kinds of church services and all that. And my mom was going to these church services, um, got miraculously converted. Jesus met her in the penitentiary, in, in a cell, and, and save my mom. So when my mom got out, uh, by God's grace, she was able to get all of us boys back into her custody, which was a miracle because here's a woman, she's a drug addict, she's a meth, you know, meth addict. And th for a judge to give children back to that type of person is a miracle, right? But she got us all back. We started going um, to a Christian church. Uh, I started attending a Christian school. And for the first time, I was attending things like Awanas and, and whatever. I just did it for the fun and games and the snacks and all that. But I was I was finally hearing about a man named Jesus who uh, I'd never really heard about. Like I I, I knew we believed in God, right? Uh, God was real, but at the same time, he wasn't personal. He wasn't anybody that truly cared about us. Now all of a sudden, I'm hearing about a man named Jesus who died for my sin, who who made a way where there was no way who can forgive us, and my mom's telling me that message. I remember I was probably in sixth grade. She said, hey, uh, Jesus can save you, Curtis. Do you want to be saved? Do you, do, you, do you not want to go to hell? And, of course, what's your answer? Yeah, I don't want to go to hell. Um, so I remember sixth grade, I prayed a prayer. I asked Jesus, yeah, Jesus, come into my life, change my heart, change my mind. And that worked for a while, but, you know, seventh grade, eighth grade, uh, my mind was not on the Lord. It was not on Jesus. It was not on any of those things. Uh, my mom, you know, continued to relapse. We moved um, multiple times. We finally moved to Bloomfield, Nebraska. That's where I started my high school years. And in high school, that's uh, God was way on the back burner. I had no no time for the Lord at that point. So it was really sports. It was girls, and it was just having fun, right? And that's that's who I was in high school. I was the fun guy. Um, 
very, very much charismatic, uh, very much kind of a class clown, a, a very flirty guy, you know, new kid. I had, you know, all the, all the girls in the school, they liked the new kid, right? So came into school, was that type of person, very popular, um, very good at sports, very athletically gifted. Um, and that was my life, right? I just wanted to have fun, enjoy life. Uh, was homecoming king. I wasn't that intelligent. Uh, I was smart enough to get by, but I wasn't going to be the straight A student. Um, no valedictorian. I didn't really care about that, but I just sports, girls, having fun. Uh, and that's what life was about. Uh, I got into a relationship early on in high school. That relationship continued into college. And in college, I just continued to do what I wanted to do, right? I was just uh, I was a free man. I knew I wanted to, I knew I had to get decent grades to graduate. Uh, I knew I wanted to do something in construction. I wanted to do my own construction company and, uh, and that was my focus. And I just continued to do that all through college. I just, uh, school, I uh, had a girlfriend, pretty serious and, uh, a lot of drinking and partying. Like that's what you did, right? In high school, that's when the drinking started in college. It was the same thing, just drinking trying different drugs, partying, just having fun, living that life. And I did that all the way up till the end of my junior year. Um, but through that time, <clears throat> like I said, I had professed Christ at sixth grade. Through that time, I, I know God never, never stopped pursuing me. Uh, I can remember my mom writing me letters and she was very up and down with her Christian walk. Uh, and some of you know my mother, uh, that's still the battle she fights today. So in my mind, uh, Christianity was fake. You know, I seen that. That's what my mom did. I can be better than that was my mentality. And I was on a path to prove that. But during that whole time, God continued to surround me, right? My, my freshman year in college, my best friend from high school, a guy that, I mean, we did everything together. We hunted, fished, hung out, fought, I mean, lifted weights, played football, uh, he was my guy. His name's Holiday Casada. Some of you guys know him. Uh, our freshman year, we made a vow. We made a pact. Hey, we're gonna we're gonna turn a new leaf, right? We're gonna be we're gonna have fun. College is just every everything that is supposed to be. We're gonna find girls and and do the party life. And once you know it, Holiday gets marvelously saved. My freshman year in college. So my roommate gets born again, right? So now he's one of these weird Christians like my mom was, but this dude was pretty solid. Um, he, he was extremely solid and he was learning and growing, but I was a freshman in college. I didn't want anything to do with that holiday. That's good for you, man. I know. Yeah, the, I know it. You know, I know Jesus is real. I understand that, but I just don't want to do that life. I remember he sat me down before he left Wayne State and uh, he prayed for me. But the, the message that he said was, hey, man, you, need, you know, he, he preached the gospel to me. But I can remember I looked Holiday dead in the eye and I said, hey, dude, that's great for you. I'll do that when I'm older. That's what I said. I remember I was 19 years old. I looked at Holiday and I said, hey, I'll do that when I'm older. When I'm 40, 50, 60, and I've lived, I've lived my life, then I'll come to Jesus. You know, that was my mindset. Uh, and I can remember, I mean, Holiday was such a great friend. Uh, I was such a terrible friend. He would send me, uh, I can remember he would send me text messages, just Bible verses, right? Simple Matthew 5, 25, whatever it was, just to encourage me. And I can remember I would be like, oh, man, you know, I, I, don't, I don't like that he sends me that. So to get back at him, I would send him like pornography and just, you know, you, we would get all kinds of terrible texts on your phone back in the day. And I would just forward him all the, all the bad texts. Finally, got to the point he goes, hey, dude, okay, I'm sorry. I'll stop sending you Bible verses if you just stop sending me the pornography. That's how tormented I was, though. And Holiday was still my friend through it all, which was also amazing. A great testimony of um, just God's faithfulness in his life and mine. I remember inviting him to a party one time. We had a huge party house. There was probably four or five of us that lived in a house. We all smoked pot. We all liked to drink. We all liked to have a good time. And I can remember I, I, I invited Holiday to come over. I said, hey, dude, you know, I was like, he's not going to come over while well, he came over. Uh, and we're all drinking around the table, partying, smoking. I mean, it was just, looking back, it was just the worst environment that a Christian would ever want to be in. Um, loud music. I mean, just our, our, our house was full of posters. You can imagine young men in their 20s. Uh, I mean, the filth and the stuff that we had on our, on our walls. And 
just everything that we were doing, the games that we were playing, uh, just the, the foolish things. And here's, here's this guy, he's sitting on my right-hand side, and I can remember like being drunk and intoxicated and, and essentially like yelling at Holiday saying, dude, what are you, why are you even here, man? Like, you're, you're such a loser, Holiday. Like, you're, this is not where you belong, and you're never going to change me. You're never going to, you're never going to get to me, man. Like, I'm a lost cause, you know, just telling him these things, like, I'm a lost cause. And uh, I can remember Holiday, I, I said, Holiday, why are you even here? Um, and this was something that I look back on, I know it touched me. Even at the moment, like, uh, I was just angry at him and, and whatever. But he goes, dude, I'm here because I love you and you're my friend. And I'm like, wow, okay, that's interesting. Looking back, it was so impactful to have friends that cared no matter what um, I was doing to them. And uh, fast forward, um, I got a job. Um, my neighbor told me about these guys. It was a construction company. Um and uh, I needed a job really bad. I was working at the Super 8 Hotel. I was a front desk attendant, and it was just like, I just kind of, this is not what I want to do, you know. I want to do construction. Uh, this is just not for me. So I wanted to get something that was more in my trade. So I talked to my neighbor. He was a construction guy. He goes, hey, I know these two guys. His name's Luke and Larry Thompson. Uh, they're called l l Construction. He goes, but... Uh, they're looking for a young guy like you that they could hire. Uh, I'll give you his number. You can work it out. But he goes, Here, here's the caveat, though. There's one thing you got to know about these gentlemen. They're a little off, he said. They're a little bit different uh, than most of your construction type guys. These guys don't cuss and sw swear, Kurt. These guys go to church on Sunday. These guys listen to Christian music. These guys are Christian. So uh, I don't know what, what if, if that makes you uh makes you change your mind but just go and see how it does so uh i ended up getting a job with these guys and yeah they were different although uh luke was kind of a hothead he'd be yelling at his dad sometimes you could see he would apologize he would want to listen to christian music uh he would he would tell me hey kurt this is what i uh i read about in the sermon on sunday and uh so god started to just surround me i could see it and then uh and then we, they hired a guy. His name was Nelson Leecraft. And any of you guys know Nelson? He's kind of an obnoxious character. He's 6'3", 220, just a big, buff, uh, black dude. And he was very outgoing, even in the world. Before he got saved, he was just boisterous and annoying and just would, would mess with your head. But then he got radically saved. And then L&L &L &L Construction decided to hire this guy. So... Now you've got Nelson on one side, and you've got a Curtis Bischolt on the other side, and me and him were just button heads left and right. Like, he was talking about Jesus and purity and, and uh, waiting, waiting for marriage, you know, before, you know, before he does all that. And I'm like, no, man, you gotta, you got to get into that. you got to try that out. you got to see if you can, you know. And, and he'd tell me, like, things like, hey, man, I bet, you can't, I bet you can't stop smoking for a week. He would just... He would say things, and then I'd say things back at him, and uh, we were just going back and forth. But God um, used Nelson in a mighty way because I had never seen a very consistent man of God in my life ever. Uh, I had just seen my mom, and Holiday left college before I really uh, got involved. But I worked with Nelson every single day, and I can say every day I'd wake up, I was hungover, I was tired, uh, I felt like garbage. And every day he would wake up and it was like he was happy to go to work. You know, he was excited. He was skipping to the truck. We'd be tearing. I mean, we're working 90, 100 degrees. We're tearing off these shingles. And he's singing like him him songs, you know, just praising God. And I'm like, dude, what is wrong with you? You know, like this is this is stupid. We're miserable up here. This is terrible. Like, why are you happy? You know, and he goes, man, I've got Jesus. That's all I need, Kurt. And I go, dude, don't you... Uh, I, I hate this job. You know, I, I didn't really like what I was doing. He goes, no, I'm just glad to have a job. I, I just praise the Lord that I'm making money. You know, he just had such a different attitude about him. And it was, it was the glory of Christ. It was the presence of God on him. So even I would, I would get around him, the presence of God would fall. And guys, sometimes I'd be standing there. I just start to weep. And I didn't even know what was going on. I would, I would weep. I'd be in tears. And then I'd just say, hey, Nelson, would you pray for me? Uh, and Nelson would just put a hand on me. He'd pray for me. And it was through experiences like that where I knew God was really trying to get a hold of me. Um, that all continued on um, until one night 
Um, I was at a party. I was drinking, and I actually uh, was drinking with, with my younger brother, Jesse, who's here, and a cousin, Ricky. And what happened was we're out on the deck. I'm lighting up a cigarette. I mean, we're drinking our beer, having a great time. It's, a, it's an amazing, it's amazing start to the night. And Jesse ruins it because uh, Jesse decides he, he crushes he crushes his beer and he throws it down on the ground in front of us. And I'm like, what are you doing? You know, I'm still smoking and doing my thing. And uh, he goes, dude, I don't know why we do what we do every single night. Uh, and we wake up in the morning uh, miserable and we just restart every day. And he goes, I don't know about you guys, but inside and I'm empty and inside I know there's there's something else I'm missing. And I'm like, Whoa. you know, here's my brother with tears in his eyes, and he's telling me what I know to be true in my own heart. I knew deep down I was miserable. Deep down, I was doing everything the world told me to do. Party, have fun, women, career, money. I had all those things going for me. Yet, here I am, I'm 21 years old, and I'm miserable inside. And it takes my little brother to say that and for God to use that to then pierce my heart. And that's when I did the same thing. I dropped my beer. I go, dude, guys, I said, I don't know how to pray. But I said, we need to pray. And I remember I grabbed Jesse's hand. I grabbed Ricky's hand. And we just started to cry out to God. And I meant it. I knew it right there. I cried out to God. And I just said, God... If you can, ch- I remember it. You, if you can, if you can change my heart, if you can save me, forgive me of all my sins. I said I'm driving my life right now, and it's it's miserable. I know I'm headed for destruction. I know it. Put me in the back, take control, and I'll give you my life. And that night, everything changed. In one moment, one prayer, God sovereignly changed my heart. Just cried out to Him. God, God saved my brother. We're working on Ricky. He's not there yet. But at that moment, I mean, it was, it, everything changed, you guys. Something different happened. I was, like I said, I'd heard about God. I had been got, been with God in junior high. I had, I, had, I had been to the Awana services. I had heard the Bible. I had been to the church services. I had heard it all. But it is one moment where I realized, dude, I am empty inside. And there's only one person that can fill it. And it was Jesus. And that night, he filled it. That night, it was Three in the morning, I called Nelson. Nelson, I'm saved. He didn't answer. Uh, and then I, I, woke, I ran home. My mom was a backslidden woman. I shook her awake. Mom, I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. I can remember that. And we rejoiced. And it was at that moment I started coming to church in Walt Hill. I started to grow. God started to strip me of certain things. The worst of it of... Um, was a relationship. I was I was with a girl for six years, um, and she was she was beautiful. All these different things, I could I could never in my mind at the moment think, oh, I could not do better than this. Like, uh, she's better than me. I don't deserve this. Uh, but I was pretty ignorant. I was very ignorant, and God stripped that from me. Uh, I was unequally yoked. I can tell you, I was very unequally yoked. But when God saves me or saves us, he changes our hearts. And now I was the one telling her, hey, we need to go to church. Hey, we need to read the Bible. Hey, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to wait till we're married. Um, And it was just confusing, right? Everything was changing. I was a different person. So God stripped that away. I can remember that day. It was a Tuesday. And I remember we we broke up. And I remember uh, getting on my hands and knees and crying out to God and saying, God, what are you trying to do to me? Are you trying to kill me? And I can remember he said, yes, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill the old man that you were. I'm going to empty you, but I'm going to fill you up. A minute later, my phone rings. It's Nelson Lee Craft calling me. Hey, Brother Curtis. Hey, what are you doing tonight, brother? We're going to go to a Bible study at a mall till. I'm like, all right, man, I'm going to a Bible study. It was at that Bible study. I confessed to the church and my wife to be at the moment was sitting in the Bible study And as I'm crying out, in her mind, she goes, man, I would love to marry a guy like that. Not that guy, but a guy like that, right? (laughs) Yeah, that's that's her testimony. She can verify it, but that's what happened that night. And then in my mind, 
I could never do better than what I had, right? God saves a man. He redeems me. He's kept me, brought me in fellowship, brought the brothers around me, built me up, kept me going, filled me with the Spirit, started to open doors. Then I meet my wife, right? We're in Omaha together. We don't wait long. We get married. <laughs> That's a blessing. Uh, God begins to bless us with beautiful children. And then four years ago, I didn't want to move to Walt Hill, Nebraska. I loved where we were. I loved Omaha. I loved York, but I knew God was calling me back here. And guys, if you're, if you're contemplating anything, you know God's calling you to do something. You got to be obedient to it. And I, and I waited on God. I, I pushed God away. I didn't want to come to Walt Hill, Nebraska. I remember I was deer hunting. Uh, and I'll, I'll finish with this. Uh, two minutes, Pastor Paul. I was deer hunting, and uh, I said, Lord, if you really want me to move to Wall Hill, I will move, but you got to bring the biggest buck I've ever shot in my life, and you got to bring it in front of me, and, it, and I've got to shoot it. And I was like, okay, I prayed that prayer. We had one, one day to fill the tag. I'm sitting in a, a, just a nasty tree stand. I got my 30 odd six. It's dark. It's 5 o'clock, and once it starts getting dark, you're, you can't shoot anymore. So it's like five minutes before it's dark. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, ah, yeah, you know, we're not going to Walt Hill. Yes, got this right. <laughs> Guys, a minute later, a big buck comes out of the timber, runs straight for the tree stand, stops 15 yards, looks up. And I'm like, whoa, okay. I'm moving to Walt Hill. <laughs> shot, shot it. And then, this, you know, six months later, God opened the door and we've been here in Walt Hill and God's been so good, you know, you, you know my wife, you know our family, he's just blessed us, but guys, I should be a statistic, my brother should be a statistic, there's no reason I should be up here testifying, this would be the last place I'd ever want to be, but God by his grace is so good, we don't deserve it, but yet he bestows that grace upon us, and we're all unworthy, but I'm so thankful that God saved me, he changed my life, and we are so blessed because of him, so I thank you.